Okay. Good morning. We're going to get ready to do our, what I like to call our preview review of the church school lesson today. I want to first of all start off with our, our uh, devotional passage. And then after we do our devotional passage, we have our invocation, and then we're going to some of the final points uh, of our introduction for the lesson on the day. Our devotional reading is going to be coming from Luke chapter 19, verse 28 through 39. It's a New Testament passage of scripture, Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 39, especially as we are here on the threshold of Palm Sunday. This becomes a very appropriate passage of scripture in dealing with today's lesson. In the language of the NIV, it sounds like this. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you untied it, say the Lord needs it. Verse 32. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Let's have our invocation on prayer now. Gracious God, as we come at this time, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to see another day which we've never seen before, the health and strength that you've given us. Be with those who have logged in to be with us on today. Be with those who have desired to be with us and cannot. Continue to keep us all. It is in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. All right. We're grateful to have this opportunity to be here on today with you. I want to just take this moment to give some honor and respect uh, to Pastor Meredith, Dr. Joseph B. Felker, Jr., and Sister Shirley Felker as well as our general superintendent, Sister Alice Jones, and our youth divisional superintendent, who is also chair of our Deaconess Ministry, Sister Vida Crockett. Hope that all of you are doing well, as well as your families. Of course, I'm thankful for the staff of our church school and our great teachers that make up our church school. And then those of you who are sharing with us, members of Mount Carmel, as well as our friends and family of Mount Carmel, we thank God for you making this a part of your busy schedule on today. Now, the lesson title for today, coming out of the standard lesson commentary, is Prophet of Courage. Now, I want you to let me know what the title is in the Faith Pathways Quarterly. Okay? Standard lesson commentary, Prophet of Courage. I want you to type in what the lesson is uh, for today. We'll come back to that title in just a second. Now, uh, our key verse for today... <clears throat> It's coming out of 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18. And again, it's in the NIV, and I know a number of you know this from by heart. This one is not as tough as last week's was, but uh, it, nevertheless, it is a good one. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18, and in the NIV, it sounds like this. I have, made, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the bells. Amen. Again, that is the key verse for today. Uh, Sister Jones, any titles up there yet? The Bearers of Bad News. Bearers of Bad, bad News. Okay. okay, now, thank you all very much for sharing. Now, our printed text today is coming from 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 5 through 18. It does have a real kind of long stretch toward the end of a number of scriptures coming together. Now, one of the things uh, that I have shared with you on more than one occasion is that this is what I like to call one of those story lessons. Or maybe I should say I don't like to call uh, a story lesson. Uh, one of the reasons why I say this is because a story lesson, if you're not careful, uh, you can get so caught up in the story that you really, you'll learn the story, but you won't realize the practical points that are relevant to you and me today. 
And so, but it's good. I mean, it's a great story lesson. It's a great situation about circumstances and situations that happens in the lives of the children of Israel. But it's also important for us to understand that there are some practical points for us here in 2021. Amen. Now, having said that, we're going to go into the introduction by, first of all, uh, just mentioning to you that many people are willing to try worshiping God. You know, try worshiping God. That's also known as going to church. But many people are willing to try that when things are not going well uh, in their lives. Uh, kind of like uh, uh, changing their luck, so to speak, or changing their way, or changing the things that are around them sort of things. And so, and I'm talking about people that just will try going to church as, as a method. Uh, for instance, uh, you have some people who attempt to bargain with God as it relates to worshiping uh, or obeying him. They don't really want to worship or obey God, but they kind of want to bargain with him. Uh, there's a story that uh, the historian, filmmaker, and professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. tells. He tells the story of how his mother had taken extremely ill, and he prayed to God that if his mother would get better, that he would start going to church. And as the story goes, his mother got well and back on her feet. And Gates says that and when he saw that happen, he says, uh-oh, okay, which meant now I'm going to have to make good on my end, which really lets us know that sometimes people say things and don't really mean that we want the income, but we don't want the outcome, okay? And so it becomes important for us to understand that. Now, having said that, unfortunately, it is just as true that many people, once they start doing better or well in their lives, begin to give less credit to the blessings or divine providence of God and more credit to their own perseverance and ingenuity. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like this, and I, you know, sometimes I oversimplify things, and this may be one of those cases, whereas uh, that sometimes when people have less, they serve God more. Uh, and then when they get more, they tend to serve God less. And so it becomes important for us to understand that that reality exists not only today, that, that existed with the northern kingdom of Israel as well. Now, the context of today's lesson shows the suffering of the northern kingdom of Israel under the ungodly leadership of Ahab and his ungodly wife, Jezebel. Uh, from a famine and a drought in the land, which, is for, is, it, and, which was actually the foretold punishment that Moses had long ago warned the children of Israel of in the book of Deuteronomy. If they persisted in disobeying God, even as they were getting ready to go into the promised land before they even got there, God gave a message to Moses to let them know that uh, if you don't obey me, some bad things are going to happen to you, and you will ultimately even lose the land that I'm going to give you. And think about it. At the time when God gives Moses this message, he had, they hadn't even made it into the land yet. And so it becomes important for us to understand that goes about those things that I talk about as it relates to prophets and their foretelling, F-O-R-E telling, and their forth telling, F-O-R-T-H telling, where in this case, the foretelling is a prophecy of things that are going to happen. And unfortunately, they do. Now, today, we see a courageous prophet, Elijah, willingly facing a defiant, ungodly king, Ahab, who has been hunting him to kill him. And so now all of this is happening, but at the same time, uh, Elijah is getting ready to give King Ahab a message that he doesn't want to hear. And so let's go into the lesson now. The scripture, uh, the first passage of scripture, the first division of today's lesson as it is entitled in the standard uh, lesson commentary, Ahab and Obadiah. And it's out of 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. And in some of your commentaries, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily in your quarterly, but they will divide these two passages up and talk about them separately. They'll talk about them as surviving the famine and then talk about them as uh, uh, surveying the land. But I want to put those two things together. I want to put verse 5 and 6 together and actually combine the title and call it Surviving a Famine and Surveying uh, the Land. So I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 for you. And Ahab said to Obadiah, 
go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. Now, interestingly enough, brothers and sisters, in a land that was literally flowing with milk and honey, a land prepared by God with plenty of provisions for his people, the same land is now almost becoming a wasteland. And, and they're, they're, they're surveying this wasteland because of drought and famine that has come upon the people. Why? Because of the defiant, disobedient, and ungodly leadership of Ahab and the actions of his wife Jezebel and the lifestyles of the nation of Israel. Now, now there's an important point that I think is necessary for us to, to come up here with because now, interestingly enough, all of these people, they still had a temple. They still had a place to go. They still spent time going into the temple, but they weren't praying to God. They still would call themselves chosen people, but they weren't acting like chosen people. Uh, they, they, they would even go to the temple and do some stuff, but mistreat one another. And so it was not just their worship style that was a problem before God. It was their lifestyle. And so it becomes important for us to understand that reality. And God deals with it. He warned them against this in the very beginning. And now we see that, uh, as Malcolm X would say, uh, the chickens have come home to roost. Well, at least they are coming. They ain't all in yet, but they're on their way. Now, we have King Ahab and one of his chief officials, Obadiah, looking for food and water for their horses. Now, mind you, this was not an action of benevolence for the nation. Uh, this was a selfish action of survival for uh, King Ahab and for his army's horses. You see, King Ahab wasn't, he wasn't taking, about it, taking it upon himself as a leader that has a country that's suffering and said, I'm going to go out and try to find some sustenance for these animals so that they can continue to live. No, he was personally going out with his main, his number one uh, chief assistant, and they were going out to make sure they could find something so that his stuff could survive, so that his stuff could continue to flourish. He didn't care nothing about his own people. It's unfortunate. So now, according to this passage of Scripture, very short, verse 5 and 6, but in essence, the two, King Ahab and Obadiah, uh, they split up to cover more area uh, in their search, which leads us to the second section of today's lesson, which is now called Elijah and Obadiah. And that's out of 1 Kings, chapter 18, verses 7 through 15. Now, this is that uh, piece that uh, uh, we're getting ready to get into this uh, longer piece uh, in a few seconds that I was talking about. Uh, first, we're going to take a look at verse 7. I'm going to read verse 7 for you under the title of Unexpected Meeting. Now, as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed down to the ground, and said, is it really you, my Lord, Elijah? Now, it's important for us to understand that our printed text, today's lesson, doesn't tell us much about Obadiah. Now, he is described in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 3, as King Ahab's palace administrator. The passage also describes him as a devout believer of the Lord uh, in, the, in the NIV version. In the King James, he's called one who feared the Lord greatly. So here, Obadiah, even though he is working for uh, a wicked king, Ahab, uh, in perspective, he has his personal life in perspective as it relates to his relationship with God. So you see, as Obadiah serves King Ahab, who is defiant and disobedient to God, Obadiah maintains his personal relationship with God as well as maintains his personal relationship with Elijah because he recognizes him even though he's not been around for some time. Which leads us to the next passage, a group of passages, which are a little long. It's verses 8 through 14 makes up this set because it's actually this conversation that we're going to share on today. It's called uh, in the commentary an unwelcome order. Verses 8 through 14. I'll read them for you. Yes, he replied. Go tell your master Elijah is here. What have I done wrong? Asked Obadiah. 
that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death. As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say Elijah is here. I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, fifty in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Okay? Now listen. Obadiah, knowing the character of King Ahab and seeing what his wife has done to others, feels Elijah is setting him up to be tortured and killed. You see, Obadiah feels he needs to remind Elijah, as if he didn't already know, what King Ahab had been doing to find him, as well as what he had done, Obadiah that is, to save the lives of many prophets of the Lord. And so he's basically saying, well, look, look, why are you sending me to this guy? You know, this guy's been looking for you. As a matter of fact, when folk uh, say that they don't know where you are, he actually challenges them and makes them swear that they're telling the truth, which means he doesn't believe them. He says, and now you want to tell me to tell him that you're here. And if the Lord moves you somewhere, he's going to think I'm lying too, and he's going to kill me. And then he goes on to say, now, don't you remember now, while you putting me in this pickle here, I, I'm one of the good guys. I'm on your team. You know, I, I saved a number of prophets, a hundred of them, and put them in caves, 50 apiece, to save their lives and provided them with food and sustenance. So please don't, don't send me on this mission to die. That's basically what Obadiah is saying which leads us to verse 15, which is the uh, unwavering promise coming from Elijah. Verse 15 reads like this. Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. Now, it comes important for us to see. Elijah assures Obadiah that he will speak to King Ahab today. Now, this is one of those moments that we are similar, that are similar in movies that you may be familiar with. You know, there are times in the movies when there are distinct, different storylines, story threads that are running along side by side, heading toward a moment when they intersect. You know, uh, and when they intersect, uh, in westerns, they call that a showdown. And in the romantic comedy, it leads to those two people who've been apart and almost coming together in the whole movie, finally coming together. In drama, it leads to the final decision of the judge. You know, when the music starts playing in the background and the judge gets ready to declare this person who everybody thought was guilty, not guilty. Or get ready to declare this person that everybody thought was not guilty, guilty. Now, unfortunately, this moment and this lesson that, that is leading to this showdown is not printed in today's lesson. Uh, nor will it be printed, it won't be picked up in next week's lesson either because we move into a whole different area. It is an unfortunate uh, reality, but this lesson ends right on the threshold of what is going to actually happen between Ahab and the prophets of Baal. But uh, you have to read that uh, in the uh, next verses of that chapter. But now, let's go, before we even get to the last verse of today's lesson that takes us there to the threshold of this showdown that I'm talking about, let's look at the third section of today's lesson, which is entitled Elijah and Ahab. Again, coming out of 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 16 through 18. And verses 16 and 17 are, first of all, categorized as an antagonistic reception. I'm going to read them for you. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now listen, it has been about three and a half years since Elijah, since the last time Elijah and King Ahab had seen or spoken to one another. 
As a matter of fact, the last time they had seen and spoken to each other is when Elijah told King Ahab that God had told him that it will not rain until he says that it should, that it should rain. That there was going to be a famine in the land as well as a drought. And from that point to this point in today's lesson has been three and a half years. From that point to this point, Ahab has been looking for Elijah, trying to find a man to kill for bringing what he calls this trouble to Israel. And so he even calls him that in the verse. He says, is that you, you troubler of Israel? King Ahab faults Elijah for the drought and the famine that has plagued his northern kingdom of Israel. He calls him the troubler of Israel in the NIV, more poetic in the King James. He says, he that troubleth Israel is what he says uh, in the King James Version. And so now, with all of that being said, we have the next verse, verse 18, where we have the last verse in today's lesson, what is called an honest answer. And the answer is this, verse 18. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now, this, this God, Baal, there's a lot of pronunciations for it. Uh, you may know it as Baal uh, or Baal or even in the plural when you're talking about more than one like he does uh, Balaam. So it all depends on uh, what pronunciation that they're using, uh, what words or translation that they're using uh, in what part of the Bible that you're reading in the Old Testament but they're referred to in those areas. Either Baals, Baals, or Balaam. Balaam is more of a plural uh, meaning more than one, things of that sort. So now, now Elijah put the blame where it belongs on King Ahab and his father before him. And his father before him was King Omri and their family. I mean, he says it. He says, you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands. Now, Brothers and sisters, there's a saying, when someone accuses your parents and your family of something, especially if you do not agree, the phrase is, those are fighting words. And true enough, Elijah did come to bring an end before all of Israel that there is only one true and living God, and he is the one that should be worshipped. And he's coming, in this particular lesson, he's approaching Ahab, with this, with this attitude in mind. It's time to get this over with. Enough is enough. It's time to show all of these people that they've been serving the wrong God for the wrong time and they've been neglecting themselves from the true and the living God who's been providing for them, who placed them into this promised land and gave them all of the provisions of it. And the same God is the one who is now punishing them because of their own disobedience. So now, Having said that, it is a courageous move in that, uh, that Elijah would come uh, to King Ahab to tell him this because King Ahab could have simply had Elijah arrested and executed, which is what he wanted to do anyway. However, sin and absolute power, both of them corrupt, absolutely. So Ahab will agree to a declaration of whose God is real on Mount Carmel. And it will not end well for the prophets of Baal. Now, that, that begins in verse 19 and goes into, you can read that uh, in your scriptures uh, as it relates to the background text uh, of today's lesson. Because unfortunately, uh, it was not put uh, into today's lesson. And it, and it becomes important for us to understand that because to put all of that background into today's lesson, it, we miss the point that is trying to be brought forth uh, in these passages of Scripture, and that is the courage that the man of God, the courage that the person of God has in a tough situation, knowing that there are consequences to telling the truth, but yet and still standing on that truth and telling it. And so it becomes important for us to understand that. Now, having said that, in conclusion, some things I want to share with you before we wrap up for today. The first thing is this one. People who speak and stand against the sins of a tolerant society are always branded as troublemakers. 
It doesn't matter what their name is, what their names are. They can be Elijah the Tishbag, the Tishbite of Gilead. They can be Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They can be Malcolm X. They can be Congressman John Robert Lewis. They could be Harriet Tubman. They could be Angela Davis. They could be Billy Holiday. Or they could be Shirley Chisholm. Any people who speak or stand against the sins of a tolerant society are always branded as troublemakers. Now, the next thing I want to share with you is this. We should always pray for those who are willing to speak truth to power while facing the consequences of their actions. Remember, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men or women to do nothing. Now, there was an Irish philosopher by the name of Edmund Burke that said that. And I'm going to repeat it again. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, and I put in all women, to do nothing. And then lastly, I think it's important for us to remember the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that says these words. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I'm going to repeat that again one more time for you. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Now, brothers and sisters, today is the 32nd day of our 40 days of restoration. We hope that you've been reading the scriptures, that you've been praying, that you've been fasting, that you've been reflecting and preparing yourselves to be restored, not only in your relationship with God, but to be restored in your relationship with one another. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you um, tomorrow uh, in our worship at 11 o'clock. Uh, it is Palm Sunday. Uh, we do want you to know that we do have some palms here at the church now. Uh, if you're in the area or you have somebody you want to stop by uh, and get some, uh, we do have some here available uh, for you here. Of course, we will have some tomorrow as well. But just want you to know uh, that we will be here uh, until early this afternoon around four, about 4 o'clock. Uh, you can stop by between 9 and 4 o'clock and pick up uh, those palms uh, if you're in the area. I want to take this moment to thank uh, our camera person, uh, Sister Jones, for sharing with us. Say good morning, Sister Jones. Good morning. So until tomorrow at 11 o'clock on the same platform, God willing, take care and God bless.